Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon or good evening or good morning or wherever you are in, in the world, whichever it is. Um, thank you very much for coming to this event, How to Open the Algorithmic Black Box. Uh, I'm Professor Chris Reed. I'm going to do a very brief introduction and then hand you over to our main speaker, Katia de Vries, and then to Kerry Greenman, who's going to comment and give us some ideas maybe for discussion afterwards. Uh, so why are we looking at this topic? Well, obviously it's because artificial intelligence is new and it's scary. It's making decisions that humans normally did. We think we understand how humans do things. This machine is doing it. Do we understand what it's doing? Right. And it's even more fearful because we've got lots of past media representations of artificial intelligence. We've got Isaac Asimov's robots back in the 1950s who caused chaos. We have HAL, the computer in the spaceship in 2001, A Space Odyssey, which goes mad, but it has control over everything. You know, the, there are lots of reasons why we who don't know enough about the technology should be worried. So we want to be confident that artificial intelligence is safe whatever that means, because of course we don't really know what safe means here, and we think that knowing how it works will help us decide if it's safe or not. So, then we get this demand for explanations. You know, tell us how the artificial intelligence is working, and that way that will save us from bias, that will ensure safety, um, that will help us allocate liability if something goes wrong. Can explanations actually help us to do that? And this is a real common theme in regulation. One of the, the things that you constantly see people who are thinking about the law and regulation here talking about is what's called the black box problem. Um, and this problem is quite simple, except I can no longer find it. I had a picture to show you. Okay, I'll just explain the problem. The problem, as it's explained, is, is quite simple. It says uh, there is, uh, I don't know, a railway track and the railway track divides right next to you and you're standing next to it with a lever and you can send a runaway railway car down either branch of the track. Right. Down one side of the track is, I don't know, Bill and Melinda Gates and they will be killed and the whole research program into malaria will stop working. Down the other one, there are six angelic children, each of whom is holding a puppy or a kitten. Which way do you move the lever? That's the trolley problem. Uh, and then we translate that to self-driving cars. And I've seen a picture of an old lady and walking across a pedestrian crossing and a baby crawling across behind. And along comes the self-driving car. Should it kill the baby is the question. We want to know how it's going to reason. Of course, this isn't really how um, people work. Yeah, if we ask what drivers do, yeah, drivers don't go around saying, do I kill the baby or the old lady? They go around going, how can I avoid this dreadful accident that's about to happen? That's the real trolley problem. And so I found this cartoon, and this is reproduced by permission of the cartoonist, wonderful guy called Tom Gold. This is the real problem, right? Your runaway lobster telephone is hurtling down the railway track. One side, you've got a boneless giraffe, a pocket watch covered with ants and a fried egg. On the other side, we've got a burning elephant. Which way do you go? And that's a very realistic representation of what the lobster, sorry, not the lobster, the trolley problem really is. So in order to try to help us understand how artificial intelligences might explain themselves, we have with us today Katia de Vries. Katia is uh, an assistant professor at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. Um, she has worked at universities in the Netherlands. Um, she's she's been busy. I I don't think I need to say any more than that. That that the Katia really understands this. I had the privilege of hearing her speak at a conference in Sweden last year, and I thought, okay, I have to get her at, to to an audience here in the UK. This was the first chance, and here she is. So I'm just going to turn it over to you, Katia. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's very nice. I'm, as Chris said, I, I have been working in the Netherlands. I have been working in, in Belgium. I'm originally from the Netherlands, uh, but I met my Swedish husband in the UK. So it feels nice to be back at the, the place where my, uh, my current family situation began in a way. But now I'm, I'm not uh, going to, to share more about my, uh, my private history. I'm here to talk about 
the how to open an algorithmic black box. And given that you might have a variety of backgrounds, uh, I will I will build up my story neatly step by step going through all the uh, essentials. So now I will share my screen. So can can well I, I cannot see anybody, but can you see it? Yeah, that works fine. Yes, yeah, that's Excellent. exactly right. Very good. So this this is the the plan for today. How I'm going to to build it up. First of all, I'm in, in the title. I say how to open up. Uh, uh, an algorithmic black box, but one of the kind of the magic words in the in the discourse around these issues is the word transparency. And I'm first going to to talk a little bit about that word. Then I'm also going to talk about so you know, AI. Chris just used the the word. Uh, how is the AI thinking? I'm talking here about automated decision making. I will tell you more about uh, that. Then I will actually tell you several ways of how you could open up the black box and peek inside. And then I will slowly build up to the notions of counterfactuals and how to use them. And that's both because counterfactuals are interesting, but also because there is kind of a pedagogical purpose. If you understand counterfactuals, then you probably also understand the, the other ways of how you can open up uh, an algorithmic black box. So let's begin with transparency. Apart from that I'm a lawyer, I also have a degree in philosophy. And one of the things that I learned from my philosophy degree is to be always a bit skeptical of big words, transparency being one of them. Transparency is a word that like, you know, love or uh, religion has a kind of a huge burden, a lot of associations that come along with it. It's this radiate, radiating lights that clean up the world. Uh, and it's a, it's a transparency is a word that has been used a lot in the, in the context of if we have transparency, then there will be no corruption. That, that's the kind of a classical context, but now since computers are taking a more and more important part in our day-to-day -day life, the, the kind of the idea is that transparency now also should kind of save computer-made decisions or computer-assisted decisions that uh, the days should somehow, if we let in those rays of transparency, that we somehow will have perfect decisions free from bias, corruption, or whatever ailments they might have. So where, where do we see the word transparency? Well, I, I, I did my PhD in Brussels, close to the core of the EU. Uh, and there I, I did a lot of research on the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Well, the UK, unfortunately, doesn't have a GDPR any longer. But the good news is that the UK GDPR is basically to a large extent, a copy paste of the GDPR. So what I'm saying is still relevant. So if we look at, at the, the EU GDPR, then you immediately see in the, in the recitals uh, where the, the kind of the ideas are explained, the word transparency is all over the place as it is in the rest of the GDPR. I, I think I counted it once. It's, I think it returns, the word transparency returns like 54 times. And there the idea is that any, uh, this is kind of the core idea in the GDPR that any processing of personal data should be transparent to natural persons. And the principle of transparency that comes back uh, all the time in the GDPR requires, uh, this is such a nice summary here, that any information that any information and communication relating to the processing of those personal data be easily accessible and easy to understand, and that clear and plain language be used. And then uh, <clears throat> natural per persons should be made aware of risks, rules, safeguards, and rights in relation to the processing of personal data and how to exercise their rights in relation to such processing. All of this has to do basically whatever anybody is doing to personal data, there is already this principle of transparency. However, 
There is also something that is profiling. That's when you are using personal data to basically categorize people in an automated way. You have a smart camera that says, this is a potential terrorist, this one is not, this is maybe a woman, this is not. Anything that you do to categorize people in a, in a computer assisted way, as we could say, is profiling. And there you have additional conditions about transparency, something that is called profile transparency. So what, the, what does that mean, profile transparency? What is required? Well, you're supposed to provide meaningful information about the logic involved and about the significance and the envisioned consequences of the profiling. So there you get kind of a very specific meaning that is given uh, to transparency. But is this, is this clear? Well, hardly. I mean, what is meaningful information? What is the logic involved? And how should you explain the significance of the envisioned consequences? This is, it. at first sight, it looks very clear, but when you read it closer, and you can see this also in the literature about this topic, it's anything. It's not clear at all. And then it should also be said that profile transparency doesn't mean that if you are profiling somebody that you should just be fully transparent. No, profile transparency is subject to limitations due to trade secrets and intellectual property rights. So we see the effect of the GDPR because it has spread around the EU. Almost anybody is, is pro processing personal data in some way. So you see an enormous amount of, uh, of organizations, uh, persons trying to somehow give profile transparency. And here I give an example because I'm from the Netherlands. I lived in Amsterdam. I give an example from the Netherlands. The city of Amsterdam here is clearly trying to fulfill its GDPR requirements. And they created what is called the algorithm register, where they tell what kind of algorithms does the city of Amsterdam use to profile, to categorize, to anticipate its citizens. And there you see that the descriptions are very concise. So there are many examples, but I picked one here. You see, for instance, the description that the, uh, the city of Amsterdam is using uh, algorithmic, systems, uh, algorithmic assistance to detect holiday rental housing fraud, all the illegal Airbnbs. So here it says, from the 1st of July, a pilot will be carried out for six months with an algorithm that supports the employees of the Department of Surveillance and Enforcement in their investigation of the reports made concerning possible illegal holiday rentals. The algorithm helps prioritize the reports so that the limited enforcement capacity can be used efficiently and effectively. Well, it's very nice to know that they are efficient and effective. By analyzing the data of related uh, housing fraud cases of the past five years, it calculates the probability of an illegal holiday rental situation on the reported address. This is information, but it's very shallow. I mean, basically, the, the, the only kind of real bit of information about the algorithm is that I learned that it's based on cases from the last five years. But there's no detailed information whatsoever about what kind of algorithm is used, what kind of logic is used. So now I fast forward. The, this was a very basic example. Now at the other end of the spectrum, we will talk about counterfactual examples. But first, we have to think something that is not explained in the GDPR. Now, if, if we assume that transparency or profile transparency in this case, if it's the answer, what, what problem does it answer? And here I, I use Margot Kaminsky, I like her work, who has kind of made a di division between what kind of problems is, uh, is transparency an answer to? And she distinguishes three categories. One, the first category is uh, systemic problems of discriminatory bias. Well, that sounds a bit abstract, but I thought, given that, that I'm talking to mostly UK people, I will use a, a scandal that probably most of you are aware of, that the, 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 the last summer, 
students could not take real exams. And an algorithmic estimate by, by Ofqual had to be made so that an estimation could be made if this student would have taken an exam, what kind of grade would have been the outcome. And here you see uh, people protesting. One of the issues is that it was kind of classist. Uh, poor kids in normally bad schools got worse results than you know, if the same student would have been in a more privileged school. So you have, when you are using algorithms, you can have discriminatory biases, class, classist biases, all kind of unwarranted biases. Transparency can be part of the answer, not a complete answer, but it can, it can show you partly that, for instance, the data on which an algorithm was trained, that there is some bias there. So again, transparency is not a full answer here, but it can be part of the answer. So another problem, decisions with significant consequences lacking an appropriate justification. Uh, here we see another image from pro protests against the, uh, in the grading scandal last summer. And here you see that a big problem is if you apply algorithms to make significant decisions and people don't understand how the decision making was made, as in eh, Chris mentioned the trolley, trolley problem, how is the trolley, the AI trolley, how is it thinking? Well, that, that's problematic. Part of justification is that you uh, provide transparency about the kind of reasoning that underlies the decision, decision. But again, transparency is not the full answer here. You can explain exactly how an algorithm works, but if there is no social, legal legitimacy, then it's still not a justification. Then you have given a factual explanation of the underlying operations that lead up to a decision, but you have not given legitimacy to that decision. So again, here we have transparency as a partial, partial answer. So objectification uh, of the subject, that's the kind of the third big category of problems where transparency can be part of the, the answer. And again, I have a nice, uh, nice shot from the UK scandal. Yeah, here you see two girls who say your algorithm doesn't know me. Here you have people who become, who feel objectified. It's very different if a teacher that has been working with you for years gives you a certain grade, then if an algorithm gives you a grade that you don't feel represents your work well at all. So what to do? Well, transparency is a partial, can be a partial answer here because it allows if, if, and this builds partly on the second point, if you know uh, uh, how, how the underlying logic works of an algorithm, then you can challenge it. And this is an important, important to note that transparency, all very often, transparency is presented as here you have the information, but if it's not empowering, if it doesn't allow for challenges, it doesn't really help one of the big problems that transparency is trying to answer. So, and this is also something that is stressed by several authors in this field, that it's important that transparency somehow is actionable on an individual level. And that also kind of fits with the ideas that you can find in the GDPR. So now, now I've explained a bit about uh, transparency. Yeah, I, I see uh, lively points made in the chat. So now, now I've talked about transparency. Now I'm talking about automated de decision making. What, what, what is it? Uh, until now, I've kind of black boxed the, the issue by saying uh, there is a computer that makes a decision. But what, what does that computer actually do? So here we, here we see uh, the, the algorithm that was used in the grading scandal in the UK. 
and this is a this is a very simple algorithm and it in a sense it doesn't completely fit with many of the discussions that go on in this debate because it's in a way it's a very classical algorithm somebody uh, has basically come up with this algorithm for you know which factors are relevant well you know schools with bad grades over the years they probably produce more students with uh, that also have bad grades so it's a, it's a very simple algorithm it's difficult if you look at it it's difficult to explain but you you can explain it yeah, you can see it it has also been done in the in the media people have explained the different there are only four factors here that are of relevance it's a it's a relatively simple rule and it's it's also very classical in that it's you could say it's a directly man-made rule while at the same time something that uh, that currently is a huge topic of debate is machine learning, which is a specific type of algorithms, also man-made, but in a more indirect way. So this is machine learning. The idea has been around for a very long while, but uh, it, it took uh, until the kind of the last decade until it really was, was feasible. But here we see the classical definition of machine learning, and that is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And here, explicitly programmed, that's what's uh, essential. So there is an indirectness, there's a learning through examples. So I, I am also a university teacher, so I can give an example. I also have two kids that are somewhere running in the background. Uh, if I'm a lazy teacher and I don't want to do my grading, I could tell my kids, eh, the one is three year old, the other one six, I will say, uh, you can do the grading. I will give you a simple rule and that rule can be you know anything that's typed in word and is longer than two pages give it an a that's a simple rule that my kids can execute and that's kind of equivalent to uh, the, the off call rule however if i'm going to use a more machine learning approach then i'm going to instruct them indirectly so i will tell them here you have a pile of exams that I have been grading. You see the grades, read each exam, and then please come up with your own decision rule, how to grade an exam. And that's basically how discriminator a discriminative or classificatory machine learning works. You give examples and the computer is allowed to construct its own rule based on that. Uh, and then something here you see machine learning, discriminative. You also have generative machine learning, and this is going to be important later on in my talk. I can also illustrate this again with an example with my kids. So I could also tell them, you know, yeah, let's imagine, let's do a counterfactual. Uh, let's imagine that my students say, dear Katja, dear teacher, can you show us examples of students that get high grades for their exam. But somehow, maybe because of privacy regulation, I'm not allowed to share real exams. So then I tell my kids who have been reading this huge pile of exams, I say, well, you have been reading so many exams now, can you make, can you make up examples of exams that would have gotten an A, exams that would have gotten a B, etc. So then you basically you are instructing a machine to look at examples and generate something, not just discriminate, not just put in different categories. No, you want to create synthetic examples, synthetic data, or whatever you want to call it. This is going to be uh, important later. But for now, if you look at the 2010s, the last decade, the success story of machine learning has been mostly a success story of classificatory machine learning. That's computers that are able to put things in different boxes, uh, categorize, uh, to separate out pictures of dogs versus cats, for example. And that's all fine as long as you're categorizing dogs and cats. But once you're going to categorize humans, you can make, or the computer can make, or the, the, uh, the algorithmic decision rule can make very painful mistakes and very painful misclassifications. 
So now that now I've talked about transparency, I've talked about algorithmic decision making. Now I'm actually going, this is what you're waiting for, about multiple ways of opening the black box. How can you do that? So we go back to this situation and we say, how can this uh, unfriendly lady, how can she, instead of just saying computer says no, also explain why the computer says no? And then there are many, many, many ways of kind of categorizing the, the different ways of opening the black, black box. But this, this is one way of sorting some of the different types out. So one way is to look at the training data. Another way is to look at the source code. The other way is to make a summary of a very complex rule and you simplify the rule. Or like the city of Amsterdam, you kind of explain it in a layman's sentence. Those first four ways of opening the black box have something in common, namely that they all look at the rule as a, a whole. They try to explain something about the decision rule in general. While in contrast, the counterfactual to which I'm going to return later in the talk has a much more individual has a much more individual approach. It's looking at why was this decision taken in this specific case and does not try to explain the whole rule. So the, the, in the, I'm not going to go into the details of the first uh, four categories, but they all have their specific attraction in different situations. So for instance, looking at the training data can be very attractive in situations like I named before. Uh, often when, if there's a bias in the data on which a machine is trained, that is repeated in the algorithm. So for instance, if I am a teacher and I'm grading all, all women, I give them very bad grades, and all men, I give them very high grades, then my kids, to which I have delegated my work, will repeat those same stereotypes and mistakes. So it's, it's important to look at the training data. However, very often, here you see again, uh, an AI robot that didn't like dark skin, machine bias, also a very well-known case in, uh, in assessing the risk of suspects. Uh, so the, the idea has been, you know, if you have polluted data, you get polluted results. And that, that is true, but it's only part of the story. So if we go back to the, uh, to the UK grading scandal, were the data polluted? It's a very difficult question to answer. I mean, the statisticians that looked at the data, they say it's excellent, the kind of the same, the uh, people from, uh, from backgrounds that are uh, not as well off socioeconomically, they kind of the same proportion of people got a certain type of great as in as last year. So it, it all felt very safe. The training data, well, were they polluted? They, they were the real training data. So, so it's difficult to know what you're actually looking for when you look at training data and give transparency about that. So, uh, uh, you know, I will just kind of uh, give one more example. So for instance, a summary model can be useful if you're a, a doctor and you have a decision support system that gives you advice about what kind of cancer a patient has. Well, if it's a very complex model with on endless variables that kind of contribute, it's nice if you can have a summary model that says, well, these five aspects are normally very important. That gives you a sense as a doctor who needs to take an informed decision that you are on top of the problem. However, and if I go back to, to the, those first four points, it's very difficult that there's always this this kind of precious balance between complexity, over complex and oversimplified. So if you give a normal individual the source code of an algorithm, it's so complex that it probably will not be really empowering. It will just kind of be confusing. 
if you're going to simplify, you might simplify so much that you kind of miss out on the real issues. So it's, it's always the complexity of the risk that nobody understands it. If you simplify it too much, it becomes so simplified that it might be meaningless and unactionable information. So now, is this too complex? Well, this is already, it looks pretty complex, but this is really a very easy one. This, the uh, city of Amsterdam, that might be a bit too simplified. So now we finally come to my white rabbit, the counterfactual, a whole different way of reasoning. The counterfactual was a, an idea that was introduced uh, in 2018 by, uh, by Sandra Wachter, who, who works at Oxford University. And it, it's got a lot of interest because it has an interesting starting point. It, it's now school holiday here in Sweden. So this is what I do with my kids, you know, yeah, I'll face, uh, I cut my face into random pictures. So here I sit. And this is to illustrate that I, as a university teacher, I often have to defend my grading decisions. Uh, students become upset and say, no, I deserve an A. And then Sandra Wachter's point of departure for counterfactuals is that she says it's important to look at how we humans in our day-to-day -day interaction, for instance, I as a university teacher, when I have to defend a significant decision, a grading decision towards a student, how do I do that? And then the, this point of departure in Sandra Wachter is that she says, well, we don't actually always explain what factually happens. I mean, when students come to me, nobody says, no, Katja, can I have a brain scan? I want to see what, what happens in your head, or I want to see your training data. I want to see all the exams that you graded, because then I can see if you're biased in some way. No, the discussions that I tend to have, have the nature of a counterfactual, that students say, what should I have done differently to get a higher grade? It's not the facts, no, it's the what if story that is actually helpful. And this kind of corresponds to something that, uh, that historians have known for a long while, and this, that is called counterfactual history or virtual history, where you say it can be illuminating to think about what would have happened if Hitler had won the war, what would have happened if Hitler had been shot in 1932, uh, 1932, stuff like that. And, the, uh, and then Sandra Wachter goes on to give a more detailed definition of what is a counterfactual exp uh, uh, explanation or example. And then she says, a counterfactual explanation describes the minimum conditions that would have led to an alternative decision. For example, a bank loan being approved without the need to describe the full logic of the algorithm. And here we also see why there has been such an enormous interest since 2018 in this idea of counterfactuals, because nobody likes to disclose the full logic of the algorithm. First of all, because it might be protected by trade secrets, or secondly, because the system could be gamed. And here you have something that seems to, to have it all. It's actionable on an individual level. It tells an individual, what should I do in an individual case? While at the same time, the owners of an algorithm or the creators of an algorithm have some protection from the, the trade secret being disclosed or from the system being gamed. Um, and well, you, you, you see endless examples of how this can work in practice here. You see, for instance, somebody who says, imagine that you are an eBay seller. There is a classification system that automatically decides fraudulent or not fraudulent seller. You get banished from, let's say, eBay. And then what kind of explanation would you need? Well, then the idea is that uh, you would be presented with an eBay seller that is as close as possible to you, a synthetic non-existent eBay seller, a non-existent alter ego that is a lot like you, but that would not have been banished. Somebody who looks, who is very much like you, but has some significant difference towards you that makes that 
you would not have been banished. Well, this sounds great. Now I have to go a little bit into the details. I'm looking at the time. I'm, I will go very quickly. Uh, I, I have to go into the details of you know, how is this technically possible? And in the, in the last years, there have been a lot of advancements in this field of generative uh, machine learning. And that means that it is quite easy to create things. Like when I tell my kids in my fictive scenario that they have to come up with, uh, with synthetic fake exams, now machines have increasingly the capacity to come up with realistic things, convincing things that actually are AI generated. So these people do not exist. This is what is called deep fakes. They are synthetically generated faces, AI generated faces. And this is what I do at night. I look at, it's very meditative. I go to the website, this person does not exist very meditative and you you see synthetic faces so can can you use this kind of technology can you use it for all kind of things well first of all it doesn't work with all kind of data so this works well with faces but you have data like cats that jump around that are not as easily synthetically generated these are synthetic cats this is kind of very nightmarish. But you have endless variations on this same theme, uh, same theme. And then how can you use it? Well, you could say that the UK grading system was an example of, no, this exam does not exist. That's maybe not a very good way to use it. But now I come back, the counterfactual. These synthetic faces that you, sh uh, that you saw have by some people been called a form of machine imagination, which might be a bit too much, but you can say that using these kind of synthetic data can be useful to imagine what could have been. Here you see the, the man who created this technology described as the man who has given machines the gift of imagination. So now, if you use this kind of technique to create counterfactuals in the way proposed by Sandra Wachter, what is good about it? Well, the good thing is that it goes away from this idea that things should be transparent, that the transparency that we talk about in the GDPR somehow uh, has to do with real transparency. A in the same way as a br my brain scan is not interesting for a student that's facing me, maybe it's not so interesting in many cases to have the source code. It can be interesting, but in many cases, it's maybe not that interesting for an affected individual. So this is, this is an interesting conceptual shift. But then the, you know, the, the counterfactual is also an ideal. It's a bit of an utopic idea. And now I have... And look, I still have five minutes left to explain what the bad things are with counterfactual, or at least the not so satisfying things. And that is, so we, we go back. Uh, in which situations can we use counterfactuals as, uh, as an explanation? So we can imagine a situation where you go to a bank, the bank says you cannot get a loan. Computer says no. What kind of explanation do you need? Or in this case, the UK grading scandal, you get a B and you say, why did I get a B? It doesn't make sense. How would a counterfactual help in this situation? Well, the problem with counterfactuals is precisely as with human reasoning, that normally there is not only one alternative reality. There is not only one decisive moment that would change everything. And this is something that has been described as the Rashomon effect. The Rash Rashomon is a, is a movie in which one murder is explained in different ways with different narrative, and it's all plausible. It all works out. And this is exactly when I'm facing a student who is unhappy about a grading decision and who says, what should I do better next time? 
normally it's not just one explanation that I have. No, I can say maybe you should do a bit more of this or combine it with this, and maybe you can also do this, this. But there is normally not one ultimate way to get to that A that a student wants to have. And it's exactly the same if you have a very complex machine learning algorithm or for that matter, a human made top down algorithm. There are often different ways of explaining, uh, explaining how things could have worked out differently. So normally you're faced with an enormous amount of counterfactuals. Not like in the utopian example of the eBay seller that there's one answer where it says, no, if you sell, if you stop selling stuff in the evening, then you will be classified as a non-fraudulent seller. No, normally there are many, many counterfactuals. And now the question is, what are we going to do with all those counterfactuals? Well, this could lead to an information overload. If you say, you know, these are 200 ways in which things might have worked out differ differently. Moreover, people are not interested in giving 200 counterfactuals to affected individuals because it might to give too much information about a general rule, which would again lead to trade secrets being revealed, gaming of the system, etc. So this leads up to the point that if you're going to use counterfactuals, normally there's some kind of selection going on. You will select the best of, of the counterfactuals. And then you get into a really tricky territory where you have to say, okay, what are we going to select? Which counterfactuals are we going to select? Are we going to remove everything that is not actionable? I mean, should we tell Katya that she got a B because she is a woman? Ah, she probably cannot really do anything about it. So maybe we should remove that counterfactual, the counterfactual of a male Katya that would have gotten an A for her exam. And what about interactions? How are you going to explain that in a kind of easy counterfactual? So, so I can just, well, I still have three minutes or something, so I can explain. There might also be interactions. So for instance, if I go to a bank, I, my loan, loan application is denied. And then I, uh, then I get a counterfactual where it says, if you would have a higher salary, then you would get the, uh, am I still on time? Then, then I would get a loan. So I, I want to get a loan. Is, is it okay, Chris, still two minutes? Two minutes. So then I decide, okay, I need to get a higher paying job. I move to another part of the country. I get a higher paying job. I apply for the loan again. But it's denied again, because apparently living in that part of the country is also a negative factor, which did not come up in my counterfactual. Then there is the question of distance. I mean, what is nearest to me? Is some, you know, my alter ego with a higher education, is that nearer to me than the Katya with a different gender? Very complex question. And also the kind of outcome that you're comparing with, also very complex. So now the concluding thought, there we have kind of one minute. So counterfactuals, are they good? Well, they could be good because I think one point to keep in mind is that algorithmic decision-making and the fact that it's black box is creating some serious problems and that even very simple ways of telling something about an algorithm is better than nothing. And a counterfactual probably, if construed well, can be useful and enlightening in some way, but it's not a panacea, it's not going to solve everything. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you very much indeed, Katja. Uh, everybody, unmute your mics and give her a proper round of applause, please. I think that's important. <laughs> thank you very much. That was excellent. Do you want to stop sharing your screen, by the way? I, and then... I, I will do that. I, I just want to say, there's an, uh, an article coming oh. out uh, somewhere later this year. So if somebody's interested, contact me. Good. Get, yeah, we, we want to see that. Is that coming out in the, the, the book out of the conference or somewhere else? It's coming out somewhere else. So it's the, the, the last point on my slide. It's in critical analysis of law, but it actually also might come out in, in the conference book.
Excellent. Right. I'm certainly going to be reading that when it comes out. So I should be looking for that in my newsfeed. Right. Well, thank you, Katia. I, I think I don't think we could have had a clearer or more beautifully illustrated um, story, actually, about counterfactuals. I, I love the illustrations, which really help get this straight in my mind. Uh, so several questions here, which which we might pick up on later on. One thing I forgot to say to everybody is that um, if you've got questions that are in your mind as, as we're going along, put them in the chat. I will keep a note of the questions and I'll put the ones that I think are most interesting at the end, um, depending on how much time we've got for discussing things. Right. But right, before we get to that, um, I think it's important to have a different perspective on some of these questions because counterfactuals are one possible tool to deal with the explanations problem. Uh, are there other ways we could do it? Uh, and so I've asked Kerry Greenman, who is a PhD um, student here at Queen Mary. She's a scholar at the Alan Turing Institute as well. So she gets to work with all the technologists there and she's been doing quite a lot of work with um, a, a colleague there who's also doing research, looking at explainable AI, the kind of tools that technologists have to try to work out explanations about how their artificial intelligence systems are doing what they're doing. Right. Now, I don't know what, what Kerry's going to talk about exactly, um, because she's responding to, to what Katya has said, but she's from Canada. She often talks about polar bears. I don't know whether they're going to turn up um, it's not impossible, I guess. Right. Christine, if you could spotlight Kerry, and then we will be up and running. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Chris, for the introduction. And thank you, Katja, for that talk. That was really excellent. Um, lots to unpack here, but I've got a few forerunners that spring to mind. Uh, so first off, I really like your framing of why and what here for transparency. So particularly in regards to the GDPR. So even before standard setting, I think it's it's such an important question to ask in terms of, of how to leverage transparency in a really you know, actionable fashion. So one question that I think aligns really well with this in my own work is the idea of sort of to whom. So for explanations looking at what is needed by which parties involved. So I think this really ties in the points you raise on whether something could be, let's say, individually actionable, like let's say with the off call thing, you know, an individual student could bring an action or structurally so when you've got sort of um, deeply embedded bias within a system. So you've got a set of different potential consumers at different points in the AI pipeline. So you've got producers and consumers, but you've also potentially got sort of regulators and courts. So courts, t in, in my mind, tend to be given to counterfactuals in, in explaining decisions, particularly in common law systems when you're sort of differentiating from other cases or different standards. You've got sort of like murder to manslaughter or um, you know, just distinguishing individual facts on a case. So in terms of counterfactuals, why and what and when seems sort of flexible or more needs-based depending on who needs the explanation. And this may fall more under accountability than empowerment, but the transparency toolbox is kind of an interesting way to frame the differing needs of uh, pre and post examination of an AI, say by a regulator in sort of ensuring that an automated decision maker isn't acting on forbidden grounds versus by a court, which might be looking at individually actionable cases. So was the information given through counterfactual, counterfactuals reasonably explanatory or given other considerations such as the Rashomon effect, was it misleading? And so all that to sort of lead to the question of do you think that the approach to counterfactuals will fundamentally differ based on an audience that is sort of non-technical but judicial? So between, let's say, the regulator and the court. Do, do, do you want to do answer that one now or do you want to leave it for later on? I think, can, can we leave that one hanging and pick it up later on, maybe? Does that work for you, Kerry? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to write it down now. So... <laughs> I, I, I'm writing your questions down and then I can take them together so that it's better to kind of do timing. I don't go bananas on one Absolutely. question. Absolutely. And it is tempting. Uh, in that case, I'll cut the polar bears. We have enough time. Sorry, Chris. Um, so I'm going to give a brief explanation of something called LIME here. So LIME is a local interpretable model. 
And so Lime is an, is an example of an XAI tool that isn't, um, isn't a counterfactual. So instead of saying you could have done this and it would have been different, it often works on something like a bit of visual data. Okay, we will drag the polar bears in. So let's say if, if an AI is looking at a picture and it says, this is a polar bear, you might ask it, well, why is this a polar bear? And the, the Lime tool might highlight, well, it's got big furry paws, it's got this big of a nose and it's really white behind it. So that's sort of just you know one other sort of tool in a nutshell. And Katya, I noticed that many of your examples look at what I would call non-embedded AI. So in this case, the Lime tool would be as well, but sort of AI that doesn't interact directly with the physical world. And you very rightfully point out that the consequences can still be highly impactful or damaging, such as let's say loans or sentencing. But um, something that I look at a lot in my own work is a potential different needs for embedded versus non-embedded AI. So I look at this particularly because non-embedded AI tend to be examining a fixed list of possibilities. So let's say what grade to give, whether to grant a loan, length of sentence, whereas embedded agents acting on the physical world tend to have fewer constraining factors. So something like a self-driving vehicle is not only contending with the concrete rules of the road, but also the variety of unpredictable factors such as pedestrians, dogs, weather, other drivers, that sort of thing. So while there's many more, while there may be more cases of what's a direct question of fact, so self-driving video of an accident, do you think that the types of scenario possible might trend away from counterfactuals for embedded AI, or that it might be helpful to frame explanations as counterfactuals considering the different types of intakes? So I'm thinking potentially of other tools here, such as Lime, which might be used to examine virtual data rather than binary. So rather than say rerunning with the nearest neighbor scenario, you have to highlight what data caused the car to stop, that sort of thing. So long winding question, apologies, but, um, and in the third case, I'll keep trucking here. Uh, Chris, do cut me off when needed. Um, so one of the things that I look at is the relationship between foreseeability as a legal concept and AI as a decision maker. So because the standard for human decision making is whether or not a result was reasonably foreseeable, but the presence of an automated decision maker sort of complicates things. And I've tended to characterize the problem as workable by examining not whether the automated decision makers decisions were reasonable, but whether the AI producers' decisions, including what data to use, what testing methods were appropriate, were reasonable, and whether complications or insufficient specificity was foreseeable. So let's say, perhaps if you're training your children to bark, maybe you only gave your children you know, three examples of good papers instead of you know, 100 examples of good papers. Um, and so from that, you know, how would you describe the relationship between counterfactuals and foreseeability? So either on sort of a, on a global architectural look at an AI, or on an individual consumer case basis. You've got one person who's been, who's been wronged by their ADM and whether they can, can look at it from that aspect. So I realized lots to chew on here, Chris. Do you want me to throw in another one or should we leave it there? Uh, You're muted. Give us, give us one more and, and then that will leave us half an hour for discussions. Um, I've only got about 50 questions of my own. Well, I, I promise not to put them all, but yes. Yeah, there's, there's lots we can discuss. Give us one more. Sounds good. And this one is a, possibly a bit more amusing than anything, but generative AI or the sort of generative adversarial networks specifically is it's such an interesting potential regulatory tool. And the idea of using synthetic data to help combat bias is very attractive. And I wonder if it would, if its use as a regulatory tool would cause either stagnant approaches or potentially to help game the system, as you mentioned. And, the, the example I've got in mind here is sort of the Volkswagen diesel emission scandal. When you know exactly what you're testing for, you're going to game for it even harder. So I wonder, is it, an, is it an example of best practices, the sort of generative data, or is it potentially misleading in framing decisions as more than a statistical probability? So let's say, particularly when you're dealing with a physical thing, let's say, again, our car driving here, it might look at something and say, ah, 90% chance that's a polar bear or 90% you know, chance that's a bicycle, 10% chance that's a pedestrian. And are counterfactuals even using GANs potentially misleading in this? So in other words, do the benefits outweigh the negatives in providing generative counterfactuals, particularly in physical scenarios, or might it do so in areas where the potential type of harm is concerning? So something like a systemic harm would be a concern, whereas let's say uh, for a physical occurrence like a car crash, it's much easier to tell that it's happened. So do you think the types of harm have a role in the kinds of explanations, counterfactuals or otherwise, that should be produced? That 
probably hit several different topics, but anything in there, I, I would love to hear your thoughts. Lots of topics. OK, let's let's then kind of kick off by asking for Katia's reactions to that. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat to see what people in the audience would like to ask. I've got a couple of questions up there already. Um, as I said, I have plenty of my own thoughts in reserve. Um, but maybe just one thing to in introduce it before we go back to Katia that kind of comes out of what Kerry's saying is that it, one of the questions is what are we going to use these explanations for? And the answer often given by lawmakers and regulators is we'll use it somehow to regulate the technology. Um, so I, I think most of these questions, most of the questions that Kerry has brought up really relate to that. What's the best way of using explanations? Is it as simple as saying once we get an explanation, hooray, now we know how to regulate? Or does the explanation only get us started? Do you want to come back in? And I guess, um, Christine, you should make us all the same size now because we're going to have a three way discussion for a bit. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for those excellent questions. I really enjoyed it. I think to, to give a proper, proper answer to them, I have to think for a week and then I will come up with, with really good answers. But for now, I will have some kind of uh, uh, floating thoughts about the, the, the issues that you raised. So, uh, first of all, so you know, to whom are counterfactuals interesting? Is it interesting for an indiv only for individuals, or is it interesting also for regulators, for judici judiciary? Uh, and then, you know, as, as a general point of departure, I am very, uh, I am definitely not an evangelist of counterfactuals in in general. Uh, and the the kind of explanation that you that you use is very much dependent on the context. So if if you have if you have explanatory, explanatory methods that try to kind of describe the general structure, then what I already said is that there is this kind of tension between getting too overly complex or getting too simple. And obviously, when you are a regulator with people who are specialized in this field, you can offer a different level of complexity. And with regard to the, to the you know, if you're a judiciary, it also kind of depends. You might hope that the judiciary has kind of some, that some, some expert will come in and that somehow, you know, some of the expertise knowledge drips in. But I think it's very, you know, the, the kind of explanation that is appropriate very much depends on who is using it. Yeah. So for, uh, it can also be if you have uh, organizations like ProPublica, these kind of uh, NGOs that try to uncover biased algorithms, people who are specialists, then you can come up with pretty specific complex information. And this is also something, uh, Kerry, that you mentioned. Now, there you come into to the, uh, to the domain of accountability, uh, something that is uh, more or less not, not mentioned in the GDPR at all. But you could say that transparency is often kind of the stepping stone to an accountable system, which has to do also with a lot of kind of formal formal requirements. Is there a good oversight? Is there, uh, is there something, is there a kind of a check and balances? Uh, and then you know, concretely, if a counterfactual would be helpful in court, again, that would very, very much depend on the case. I, uh, given that most people uh, working in courts are not technicians, it could be kind of a, a helpful illustration in a specific in a specific case, as well as in a specific case, you know, the line which you mentioned where you kind of look at, you know, why, why does a smart camera recognize a certain image as a polar bear? And that you look at the kind of different levels of features that that play the role in 
uh, in that assessment. That could be interesting as well, but it depends very much on you know what kind of decision, what kind of classification is it. So that that's very very context dependent. But one of the things that I think is important, and there is also research about that, uh, that it should not be that transparency becomes a very formal thing where you say, well, I, you know, like the city of Amsterdam maybe says, no, we have provided transparency. Now we check that box. Uh, and that it gives kind of a, a false sense of, ah, but this is transparent, this is accountable, this is explained. So I, I think the counterfactual is kind of a, it's sympathetic in that it goes to the individual level, which you know, like Lyme does that also uh, in another way, but it's, it's sympathetic. But I definitely would say the best way is probably to use different tools at the same time and see how they combine together and which tools you will choose will probably depend on the particulars of the, of the case. I think that, that, that was my thoughts about question one. Yeah, can, can, can I come in on that? Because it, yes. it, it, it seems to me that, that one way of, of helping understand it might be to ask if you like, what's the underlying question that we want to answer? And, and I can see from your presentation and from, from Kerry's questions, because I forgot to say foolishly that Kerry is working on the problem of artificial intelligence, which might kill you. So her focus is very much on accountability and liability, amongst other things. And, and in an AI that, that, let's say, might kill you, let, let, let's pick one that lives in between the domains. So you talked about medical technology. So we have a medical diagnosis technology, a cancer diagnosis technology, right? We might want to ask the question, should it be used at all? Right. Yeah. Is it is it safe to let this out into the world and for people to start using it? Or a bit later on, we might be asking, okay, has it got defects which we should try to fix? And a lot of your counterfactual examples seem to me more about finding those defects which maybe need to be fixed. And then the third point where we might need explanations is saying, should the doctor or the hospital or whatever be liable for the ill consequences that the patient suffered when this AI was used? And I'm, I'm struggling to see how counterfactuals help in that. You know, I, I'm the judge. Uh, I go, okay, the, uh, the claimant is, is uh, their cancer wasn't diagnosed. Any competent doctor would have done it but instead they relied on an apparently competent AI, which wasn't. Um, yeah, telling me how the AI could have made the decision differently doesn't really help me understand whether it was wrong in this instance. So does that kind of fit in with your thinking, Kerry, on it? It does, yeah. And and I think Kata is an excellent point that it, that it is case dependent. I mean, let's say if you're trying to determine whether um, a, let's say, a loans company made a decision based on protected grounds that they shouldn't have done, then it's, it's a much more straightforward question to go, well, you know, you, you took into account this thing, and had that been different, they would have been granted the loan. In a very different question than, let's say, the medical liability side of things of, are we trying to figure out if there's a problem with the machine and using it at all? So very much, I, I agree with both of you, just in, in sense of timing. Uh. Katja, do you have a view on yes. that? It... Yes. No, so I, <laughs> I, <laughs> absolutely. This this also kind of allows me. Uh, so if I if I can just make a little uh, aside here, that in this talk I talked about the use of synthetic data to create transparency, but there are endless other uses of uh, of synthetic data, and one use that I uh, would like to mention in this context now that we're talking about self-driving cars and you know killer drones that are based on AI, everything that could potentially kill. One, one relevant thing here is that uh, synthetic data have been also used to what is called adversarial examples. So that is basically kind of a reversed Turing test. You have that polar bear and you change something in the picture of the polar bear it still looks like a polar bear to us, but suddenly the drone or the self-driving car classifies it as 
a red traffic light or an uh, extremely dangerous terrorist gathering and boom, the drone you know, begins shooting the, the, the innocent polar bear or the, the self-driving car suddenly well, goes berserk and drives over the polar bear. So there you can see that this is from a security perspective, this is really challenging. And this is the kind of use that you don't necessarily want. You don't want your nice categorizing self-driving car or your categorizing uh, drone to misclassify because it has been fooled by this kind of optical illusion for machines. But you can see it, and this relates, I think, to what Chris said. You can also see it as, you know, this is kind of a very practical issue to show you know, what is the kind of the tipping point what is the tipping point where a machine flips into a different direction, which is insightful in a very specific way. You could say, you know, when Lyme gives a localized, individualized description of why, was, why did a self-driving car identify the polar bear as a polar bear and then these kind of you know it were the, the ears and the, the white face and the fluffiness that that played a role in it different features are identified here you kind of identify a tipping point where you say if we change this then the drone begins shooting the polar bear but it could also be something else you know if we change another pixel it also begins shooting the polar bear so in in that sense, it, you know, it, it's this specific kind of, no, it, it has in a specific context, it has this very actionable sense, which I think could also be relevant in certain contexts with, you know, in when we, if they leave the grading aside, it could also be relevant, I think, in the case of self-driving cars and killer robots or cancer, uh, uh, diagnosing tools, but in a specific context, mm -hmm. I think it would be right. And actually, I, I'd like to ex expand on that very briefly because I think there's a two sort of really interesting examples for our audience here. Um, particularly in terms of self-driving vehicles, I mean, we're, we're joking a little bit with the polar bear, but classification is exceptionally important for embedded AI. And in fact, the, the uh, self-driving vehicle crash in Arizona last year, I believe, was because the vehicle could not identify what was on the road ahead of it. It kept struggling to, to classify it as either a cyclist or a pedestrian. And it was in fact a pedestrian walking their bicycle across a very dark highway. The vehicle's failure to classify this meant that it didn't do anything, didn't stop, hit and killed the, the uh, person walking the bike. And there's, there's other questions here such as would a human driver have seen it or not? But in, in a nutshell that the classification can be quite important the other point as to what Katya mentioned about you know, changing a few pixels, it is or isn't a polar bear, you can also do this live. Uh, and there have been GANs experiments done on stop signs. So putting stickers on different parts of a stop sign so that a self-driving vehicle will not see it. Uh, so it very practical considerations to have, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the problems we get to in this whole discussion is that we inevitably anthropomorphize the AI. So we talk about what it sees and we talk about what it thinks and we talk about what it knows and what it believes. And I think in any debate on this, you, the three of us know that that's not true and we're using it as a shorthand. But for anybody listening who's not been working in AI before, don't be fooled by these words. Yeah. Nobody knows if the machine is thinking, but if it is, it's not thinking the way we do. No one knows if it's seeing really, but if it's seeing, it's not seeing the way we do. These are metaphors. This is saying, yeah, the behavior here looks a bit like what humans do. Um, and that's part of the problem, because as Katy has been explaining throughout, you know, the people who need the explanations are humans. Yeah, Katia. So, so here I would really uh, like to ho hop in, I, uh, because I think that the point you make, Chris, about that we shouldn't anthropomorphize the machine, that is very, very correct. But at the same time, when we talk about transparency, I think uh, it's important to look how, how do we humans use explanations in our uh, in our day to day life. And I think in that sense, 
because this is kind of the ultimate anthropomorphization. If you say that synthetic data, like the synthetic faces that I showed, if you call that machine imagination, well, I, no, we are not going to anthropomorphize. It's not a machine dreaming away. It's not a machine hallucinating. But if you think in a functional way, so what does human imagination do for us? And then how can you use this capacity of machines to create convincing variations on existing reality? How can you use that? And I think that uh, when we talk about counterfactual examples, firstly, you, know, you can say it, it very much aligns with this kind of imagine an alternative reality. But when we talk about cars uh, driving into a, a traffic sign because a little bit has, sign, uh, has changed, you could say this is also, uh, you know, you're imagining a different, an alternate option. And I think one other way in which synthetic data are used, for instance, in, in training cars, is that you have a, a problem. So, yeah, you want to train a car on, on uh, driving around. And normally, normally car crashes don't happen that often. So you have a limited amount of data about car crashes. So what, what, what you see now is that when, uh, when companies like Tesla or the Google car train their cars, they also use this kind of the capacity for machine imagination. They use synthetic data. They create endless simulated car crashes to train data on, to train machines, to train cars on imaginary situations. And that, uh, that kind of, you know, it, it, the question is, you have synthetic data and you can have many uses for it. Uh, but I think that if you think about synthetic data as imagination, that that helps to identify possible uses in the same way as I can tell my kids when they have to learn to grade exams to, to I can tell them, imagine other B essays or essays with a grade A. Imagine that. And they will probably learn faster than a machine will that cannot imagine. In that sense, I think the counterfactual is very useful if you're talking about transparency, because it shows something about how imagination is used in human explanations and potentially might be useful in machine explanations. So, so here I would make a bit of a case of doing a bit of anthropomorphization, but from a functional perspective that you think, how do we humans use imagination? And if you think from that point, you can see the use of counterfactuals in many scenarios, but also in transparency scenarios. Uh, yeah, no, I, I have to declare a personal interest in, in synthetic data, because one of the things that I, I do for recreation, or will do when I'm allowed, is to go and fly gliders, the aircraft with no engines. And um, Cathy has talked about the killer drones who are busy shooting at the polar bears. But actually, it's a bit of a worry for me that drones are being developed that are not just the toys that you buy off eBay, but are big enough to carry people. And the idea is they will be flying around the sky with me. And one of the conditions will be that their artificial intelligence navigation is good enough so they don't hit me. Um, and the training is, of course, using synthetic data. Right? You know, they're not going to let them loose and see whether they hit other aircraft. They have to simulate the aircraft in the sky and set the, the simulated drone loose and see how well its technology does. So it's kind of particular development and testing stage. I can see that synthetic data is going to be hugely important. And I think I've, I've, I've got a tie in between both of those and a random third point in that I think you get you've got an excellent point on using synthetic data, you know, to to do more scenarios and then the, the practical concerns of, of translating it to real life. And I, my third point is that that's sort of the foreseeability problem, isn't it? Because when you've got an embedded with any possible thing in the world is you've got an all possible worlds problem is you're asking the producers you know, what was it reasonably foreseeable that they train against and you know, even though we've got synthetic data we can we can simulate so many things every once in a while you're gonna get something really weird and my favorite example of this is from my my home city of Regina Saskatchewan 
there's a man who likes to drive his his pet alpaca around Chewbacca the alpaca and the 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 alpaca sticks his head out the window now in in probably very few uh synthetic sets of data would you have an alpaca in Canada in the middle of the prairies in the winter but it does it does sort of frame that problem of what is it reasonably foreseeable to train against? Do, let's say, if you're regulating this, how much do you focus on the really niche edge cases versus you know, the 99% that it's actually going to encounter very likely? Yeah, I'm, it's really interesting. I, although Katya hasn't yet answered all Kerry's questions, I, I've, we, we're talking between ourselves and we're neglecting the audience. And I've had a couple of questions from them. So I thought I, I'd throw in the easy one first, which I think I hope has a short answer. Um, this is Christina Veritimidu, who says, uh, yeah, considering the problems transparency tries to solve, sort of discrimination, human dignity, giving some kind of explanation, right? do you think the GDPR is the right regime to address these? Because at the end, it's not only about privacy. And, and I think that's an important question because the European Commission document last year basically said, yes, we've already got just the right regulation, which is the GDPR, and we'll just sort of expand it to cover AI. Um, I hope they're rethinking that. But do you have a view on this, Katia? Because you kind of began with GDPR. That was your first bit of law in your presentation. Well, very short answer. No, probably it would be useful to, to have other pieces of regulation as well, because the well, there are two aspects. So if you are kind of uh, friendly, if you love the GDPR, which I do on some days and on some days I don't, but if you if you are very sympathetic towards the GDPR, you can say it's a rather broad tool. So if you want to give it a friendly interpretation, you can always say it's all in there already. All these kind of the big ideas, you can get them out of there. But when we go in terms of foreseeability, that might be a bit problematic that you have to kind of milk it out and that it always has to be tied to personal data uh, because we, when we're talking about a self-driving car and we're only processing uh, traffic signs and cows and uh, dogs and alpacas and whatever data, non-personal data, then we're suddenly in a whole completely different regime. So probably we could use some other additional regulations as well, and they are working on that on an EU level. Well, this was not very short, but reasonably short. Yeah, no, it, it, it's like like all lawyers' answers. Our first answer is, well, it's complicated, and then we go on to explain. Of course, yeah. Kerry, did you want to say anything about GDPR here? No, I think Katya covered that really well. Yeah, I mean, it, agree? It, it, it kind of when you think about the self-driving car, it's fairly obvious that the GDPR doesn't have a lot to say about the core problem. Yeah, what if it kills people? Or what if it's an accident? You know, does it say much about that? Not really. Lots of interesting stuff about the people who ride in them that GDPR might have things to say about. But yeah, so, so the regulatory system will clearly have to go beyond simple privacy law. And I, I guess that kind of links to something, is a, is a point made by, by Barry Scannell just now, who says, um, which is, I think, probably linked to our anthropomorphism point, that a lot of people, and I'm paraphrasing him, but a lot of people talk about the AI being negligent. And um, Lady Ada Lovelace said, you know, a computer can only do that which is programmed to do. It, it's not thinking in itself. Now, there's a long debate out there about when AIs might become intelligent enough to be really intelligent and recognised as such, we're nowhere near there yet. At the moment, the focus, says Barry, ought to be really on is the product effective in its design? Or I would add, not just design, but its method of production and its testing. It seems to me those are the three places that yeah, a bad AI can come out from. I mean, Kerry, this is, this is definitely something that you've been thinking about, I know. Do you any any response to Barry at all? Oh, hang on. No, no, you, you've... Every time. I'm going to throw that to Katya first and I'll follow up. <laughs> okay. Well, I try to be kind of concise again. Uh, but uh, so, so the idea is that uh, when we talk about Ada Lovelace, we, we, we go a bit back in time and 
uh, ob obviously an algorithm is programmed by humans. But as I said, when you throw in machine learning, you throw in a certain indirectness in the, in the learning process. So to, uh, to give an example, if, if I am again using my kids and I give them indirect instruction, I give them all my exams and I say, no, please find out what is an A exam, what's a B exam, etc. Then I I don't know exactly what is what kind of model, what kind of little decision rule they are building in their head. They probably even don't know them that themselves. They have a gut feeling about what an A exam is and what a B exam is. And then you can, if in terms of liability, you can look at it in two ways. You can say. Uh, well, Katja, you only gave them three exams to learn from. That that wasn't good parenting. You you haven't done it formally right. So you should be held accountable for the fact that all kind of good students got horrible, horrible grades. Then then I formally did it wrong. You can also say, and this is a, you could say a bigger problem that maybe I'm an you know an excellent instructor. I followed the book in. I said you know here you have a hundred thousand of very good examples of how you should grade your exams. And they begin doing that and it looks fine. And then after two years, it turns out that they have made in individual cases, horrible racist mistakes. And this, this is a bit of a problem that sometimes, even if, if you have done it by the book, even if you had good training data, it turns out afterwards that things have where mistakes were made and there there you have i would say a, a real heavy you know problem like who is liable then in that case if you if you have done it by the book and it still goes wrong in the end uh, and that's kind of the, the the problem with indirectness you know, in the same way as it's intransparent to me what goes on in the the, the little heads of my kids for a programmer because it's indirect learning, it's problematic that you don't really know on you know, what happens, what is that enormous difficult algorithm that is being built, and you don't have really oversight over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you want to come back in on that, Kerry? Oh. Michelle, no, and, and all excellent points, absolutely. And I think it's it's important to throw it here in here that there's a real difficulty of standard setting in this area. I mean, this is this is new ground. You've certainly got a break in the chain of causation of decision making, but that doesn't mean that you haven't got a human making the decisions. And I think there's, there's a real point that AI cannot be negligent because we still have what we call very narrow AI. They don't learn generally, they learn on very specific things and they can be very good at that, but it's gonna be very narrow what it can accomplish. So it can only really do what it's been trained to do. And even if you've got self-learning AI, you've got someone approving the decisions, giving it the data sets, that kind of thing. So I think really, if you're looking at it from the civil sense, it comes down to the reasonable person. So you can't really have a reasonable AI because it doesn't have the, all the extraneous bits of being human, the sort of context of what's normal, what's okay, what happens. Whereas you, and, and that means you can't ask it questions of what was foreseeable because to an AI, nothing really is foreseeable. Thus you're looking at sort of the humans in the process. And so you've got not what, what was reasonable AI, but what would a reasonable programmer have done of the AI? So that comes in at so many stages in the process. You know, did they give it reasonably robust data for what it was going to do? Uh, did they test it in a reasonably robust number of ways? You know, did they give it enough sort of training scenarios to test it on? That sort of thing. And from that, you've also got a changing level of knowledge. Is we've got from other cases, and hopefully Chris might know the, the name of the case here. But if you're holding someone to the standard of a reasonable professional, the reasonable professional is not a static concept. And there was a case where you had glass vials in a hospital, but it was unknown that you could have micro cracks in the glass. So whatever was in the vials became contaminated. And the hospital wasn't found negligent because it wasn't known at the time that these could leak in that way. After this case, though, it was known as sort of the general knowledge of this profession that this could happen. So one of the interesting things about AI is that it's going to so radically change what is reasonable because it's such a quick moving field. Yeah, now that, that's that's really important. That That's um, Bolam and Free and Barnet Hospital, if anybody really wants to know. That's in my head. Uh, Katya, I have a question. We, we're nearly out of time, but 
we've got some a number of questions I would love to bring up if you've got an extra 10 minutes. Can your children wait for their bedtime story or whatever they need for another 10 minutes? Yeah, oh, that's really kind. Thank you. Well, in that I, case... I have a husband who will take care of that. Story. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. And and probably in Sweden, he has a legal, legal obligation to do so as well. Yeah. OK, I, I'm going to try and sort of cut and shut several questions together because there's an interesting debate going on in the chat at the moment that's that's kind of focusing on one point which i think is very interesting um and three or four people here are, are talking about this shazia khan says yeah how can an ai be negligent if we don't have ai standards of care or do we um shreya gupta is saying look yeah since the ai is made by humans then couldn't we just focus on what the humans did and robert carolina who I've known for an embarrassingly long number of years, I think possibly even before the Data Protection Directive 1998 uh, came into being, but certainly around that time, um, has a question that is, is nicely set out in the chat. You can read the whole thing there. But effectively, he seemed, I understand him to be saying that actually we're interested in understanding what the AI is doing in order to understand whether the humans behind it were culpable in some way whether whether they produce something that shouldn't have been let loose or whether they should be responsible for the damage it causes or whether they should take steps to put it right uh, I, I don't think I've, I've badly misrepresented any of them and and I, I find that a really interesting question because we, we go look and say we give us explanations and that will solve everything and is that maybe all that we need to know yeah actually what was the malfunction in the AI for which we might need a complex internal explanation of one kind or another? And more importantly, what does this tell us about the humans behind it, who are the people who were actually interested in? Well, thanks. Those are excellent questions again. And I think they, they tie very much to the discussion we, we had uh, earlier also about uh, in the end, when we're talking about law, then uh, then you're going to tie liability or accountability. You're going to tie that to to humans, even if that, to a certain extent, is a legal fiction. Where you say this is kind of the general level of knowledge, as you just mentioned in this case, the general level of uh, professional knowledge, and it is kind of also ties. Uh, if we go back to the GDPR, the the kind of the, the, the state of the art that uh, there is an expectation that you should do things according to the, the, the state of the art in uh, in your field. So you're going to create this kind of legal fiction, a legal standard where you say, if you have not done this, then you're liable. And in law, we are normally kind of not trying to find this kind of the, the, the true kind of the, the truth, like in this, did this person, was this person really kind of an evil mastermind unleashing uh, a, a horrible grading algorithm into the world? And should this person be punished for this enormous moral wrongdoing? But you're trying to find a, a legal decision rule, if you want, to kind of solve problems in, in, a, in a kind of, you know, Kind of fair but pragmatically clear way, and I think that that's the way forwards uh, in terms of liability uh, law, how how it will go. But then next to that, you will also have some kind of developments, I guess, in terms of insurances. You know, when if a, if a, if a smart car goes bananas, despite d despite. Uh, all kind of professional standards being taken into account. Who is going to pay? Who is going to pay for all the, the polar bears that have been crushed? Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, one of the things that comes out of that last point is that, yeah, one answer in a lot of areas is to stop asking the question. Um, in the same way that New Zealand has for personal injuries in road accidents and hospitals and things, there's there's a statutory compensation scheme there. Under the UK's, um, oh, the Vehicle and something, Aircraft and Vehicle Act? I can't remember, some, some weird name. Anyway, whatever the UK 
legislation is that allows AIs to be tested on the road. Right? One of the main points of that legislation is that whoever's operating the AI is effectively strictly liable for any damage that's caused. So you don't have to ask the liability question. Right? And that will obviously be covered by insurance. But then behind that, you can ask the liability question when the insurance company is deciding who it wants its money back from. So yeah, it's still it's going to be an important question for us lawyers, but there are ways of dealing with it in a legal and regulatory system, which might include not even asking. And building on that, I think the ultimate legal and regulatory question is what do you want to incentivize? So particularly in, and I'm biased here, but accidental death scenarios, many of the applications we're looking at that are going to cause accidental deaths are because the areas that are highly societally desirable. We want you know better medicine through AI. We want better transportation through AI, it's greener, it's cleaner, it's safer, all these things. And if you are tying potentially disastrous levels of, of liability monetarily to groups, then that's concerning. But of course, you also want to incentivize it to be as safe as possible. I, I, so it's, actually, it's a balance. I think that's really interesting. If, if we go back to the cancer diagnosis AI, I mean, let us suppose that doctors scanning images for cancer get it right 90 percent of the time so one in ten cases they get it wrong okay um our ai comes along it's better than the doctors it's 95 percent, so that's great so we put it into operation and then we start looking at the five percent that go wrong and we discover weird reasons why the ai is doing it it's kind of like the misclassified polar bear point um it's it's not even looking at the cancer itself it's looking at, at i don't know the, the bones of the patient they're going oh my goodness this woman's tall obviously she doesn't have cancer um and in five percent of the cases weird stuff is going on which we think is completely wrong but on the other hand it's still better than the doctors in the other 95 cases i think that's really difficult that in some ways knowing what it's doing is less helpful than knowing how good it is <laughs> Or might be. And there's maybe a potential point there is, is let's say with that 5% with the AI, you might be able to go back and tell why it got it wrong. With the humans, you can't. So, I mean, there might be a case to be made that if the AI is not only more accurate, but also improvable, you know, if it can repeatedly get better. And that's one of the problems with drivers is human drivers are lousy. They've always been lousy. They will always be lousy. But AI, if, if you can start it off better, could become even more exponentially better in a way you couldn't and shouldn't reprogram a human. Yeah, that, that's intriguing. A, a, a different field, but related. Ilya Sirano has just said, OK, you know, AI, if, if we assume that automated decision making is always going to be imperfect, shouldn't its decisions always be deemed rebuttable? Right. But that strikes me as being odd because we don't do that for humans. We know that human decisions are always imperfect and at some level biased. And yet we don't go, well, yeah, but they're always rebuttable. It's, lots of the time we have to say they're final. You know, it's, if once the judge is judged, that's the judgment. Right. No, no good going back. Uh, oh, okay, if, yes. if, can I just jump into that? That the, I mean, if you're talking about cancer diagnosis and that maybe the machine is has really weird reasons for uh, for for creating a certain diagnosis then i mean one one strain of thought has been that the machine should be explainable that you should know why the machine is taking certain decisions and even for very weird reasons because then it can be like a conversational partner it's a decision support system so if the uh, the idea the idealized idea would be that the doctor says yeah i think this is a cancer type b because this and this and this and then the machine says well i think it's a cancer type c because and then the the, the doctor will say well those are very strange reasons but it kind of challenges how i think about it and that that would be the kind of the idealized idea of what is called as centaur chess that if you let a machine and a human collaborate together that they can achieve more but but this is very idealized uh, i mean often machines just have very strange reasons which makes you think okay that's just weird yeah exactly i think th this is fascinating i could happily sit around for another hour though 
I'd rather we were doing this in a bar with a couple of beers, which would be a much better way. And, and um, I've already promised Katia that I will make my way to Sweden somehow um, in the near future and talk to her students. And we will indeed have that that beer or beverage of choice and carry on the conversation there. Uh, but we're already over, over the, the allotted time. Um, what's awful is, is now they're off of talking about medical AI and, and, and um, in rational decisions. This is great. Uh, do you all both want to say anything to finish off? Just a sort of couple of closing words and then I'll say goodbye to everybody and wrap up this session. Any final thoughts, Kerry? Now you, you go first. We have to finish with the star of the show. Absolutely. You know, I, and I think really Katya brought in such an excellent approach to counterfactuals. I mean, really, this is stuff that, that is very very difficult to articulate it then she makes it look so easy i think it's it's such a an open question as to to how how we make things accountable how we how we look at them in a lens of of a thing we've we've never done before you know whether that's foreseeability reasonability liability you know anything in ending in illity i think it's important to keep in mind the two things number one and i'm stealing this from chris that we have to remember that ai don't think like humans and the anthropomorphization is helpful and hindering depending on the circumstance and it's really hard to tell which at times. And secondly, the just to reiterate my previous point of a lot of it is figuring out what we want to incentivize. I mean, every approach has its issues. It's just figuring out what's what's the best for society and humanity without you know giving too much slack, without making things too unsafe. How do we incentivize the best of both worlds here? Yeah, thanks, Kerry. Yeah. Katya, what's, what do you want to leave them with? <laughs> No, the, the, the pressure for wise words is enormous. <laughs> but, uh, so, so I would say, first of all, I think it's, it's such a fun area to think about because it's still very much in the, in the open. If you begin reading all the articles, you think, oh, this is so extremely technical and mathematical and difficult. But I think when you look into, the, look into this area, it's, it's very important to keep in mind that it's still so much under development that you can go into... into there's freedom. There is freedom to, 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 to think, and that's very good. And secondly, I would like to say that one of the good things of this area is that it forces you, you, know, you should not anthropomorphize, but thinking about how does a machine think makes you also kind of go back to how do we actually think and how do we make decisions and why do we find a certain explanation good or not? It, it forces you to kind of go back to question how do we humans do and how would we like, you know, what good things should a machine learn from us and which things we would like to leave out? I, I think that's that's a perfect last sentence. That That's spot on. Yeah, I mean, what we've done tonight, we've looked at why explanations are important. We've looked at some of the ways you can make them. We've realized that we don't really understand what explanations do and what what their importance is and how we humans make them. So you're going to go away confused. The one consolation I have to use a line I, I use a lot is that at least you're confused at a much higher level than you were when this started. Uh, and the nice thing is, OK, we don't understand these things yet, but actually the process of looking at them may help us to understand them a bit more. So just before everybody goes home, unmute your microphones. A big round of applause, please, to Kerry and Katya. Thank you both very much. It's been excellent. Thank you. Thank you.